Hello, and welcome to Building a Teen Book Club. I'm Maggie Reagan, Books for Youth Senior Editor, Books for Youth at Booklist. Before we begin, we'll be going over some technical details. Links to the slide presentation and to the HarperCollins Children's Books Book Club Guide were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble, you can contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned before. From there, you can select show or hide captions from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of your captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. We have a wonderful event planned for you today, and we'll hear from our fantastic author panelists later in the program. But first, we're going to kick things off with a special presentation from Jennifer Velasquez. Jennifer is the author of Real World Teen Services from ALA Editions and the co-author of the upcoming Libraries Supporting Teen Mental Health Environments, Programs, and Services from Bloomsbury Libraries Unlimited. She has also written numerous articles on serving teens in the library settings. As an educational diplomat with the U.S. Department of State, she has assisted libraries in the Czech Republic, Macedonia, Ukraine, France, and Italy with the implementation of services for teens. In 2011, Library Journal recognized her as a mover and shaker in the area of innovation, and she is the recipient of the New York Times Librarian Award in 2005. Jennifer serves as coordinator of teen services for the San Antonio Public Library System, Texas, and as a lecturer at San Jose University's iSchool, California. Thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Thank you all. It's really a pleasure to be here speaking to so many of you about teen services and about cultivating book clubs with teens. We're gonna break our, our conversation today up into three sections. So our agenda looks like this. We're gonna talk about expectations we may have around teen book clubs, some things to consider, and finally some real world tactics that we can employ at our places of work with teens. First of all, let's talk about those expectations we may have for book clubs. Um, and I think that this is really essential to our conversation because if we go into thinking about book clubs with teens with a particular set of expectations, it can be kind of dangerous for us to start off in that way. You know, children's services is so well developed in, in public libraries and teen services may not be as fully researched or developed and it allows us sometimes to fall into pitfalls. And one of the things that I've noticed in working with um, teen librarians is that, and this is a natural human thing, it's easy for us to work with teens that are like us. And sometimes it's trickier to work with teens that are not like us. And so, we're book people, we love books. <laughs> we can't imagine a world where people don't love books and don't love to read. So it's really easy for us to point our services like a book club towards those teens 
that are like us in that love of books and reading. And sometimes it's trickier for us to to deal with those teens. We don't understand how teens uh, don't love books and reading. The other expectation that's uh, that sort of dogs us, I think, when we think about book clubs is, you know, we there are these tropes about book clubs, right? <laughs> you you know, the, the memes about book clubs, about my book club being able to outdrink your book club and, you know, sort of the the whole way um, a grown-up book club uh, might look and trying to translate that into what a teen book club might look like. And be honest, do you always, when you're in your book club, do you finish your book all the time? Be honest. So some of those expectations we may have about the way a teen book club looks, I think, are captured very nicely here. And these are these are literally stock photos. These are stock photos um, and they are used um, in some of the advertisements that libraries actually put out on their website. And so when, when, uh, when we're approaching our uh, teen services book clubs, we may have these things in our heads and they may, they may not have anything to do with what the reality of a teen book club is like. So I wanna, I wanna put here some things um, that are um, maybe considerations that you have. Um, you may find yourself saying, you know, I want, I want to share this love of reading with, um, with teens in my community, or um, I want to point teen. I want to use a book club to point um, teens in the in the direction of you know really quality things that are available for teens um, in our collection. Or you know you may say to yourself, um, our our teen advisory board. You know they select the books but they never come to the book clubs. And finally, um, if you have this impulse to say that, you know, you know, if teen, teen librarians love to say, if you feed them, they will come, but you may find that teens come for the food, but they never read the book. So there's some disconnect um, in our approach to um, teen book clubs. So I wanna start by considering, I'm trying really hard to get rid of, this Q&A window that I've opened. Go away, Q&A window. Where's the red bubble? I am a professional. Okay, so I wanna start with some of these considerations um, and we'll work through these before we get to some real world tactics. And you know, we're not, we're not dealing with a, a captive audience if we're a public library and we should strive to not make a book club feel like school. We should look at our overall teen programming approach and recognize that teens vote with their feet. And, you know, if teens start to ask for a book club, this is really a beautiful moment. It's a time to support it, not force it, but to respond. And I'll tell you, frankly, I've been a teen services librarian for 28 years. And the times that we've had book clubs are times when teens ask for them. Um, so I have, a, you know, hey, miss, do you have a, a book club? My response is always, yes, we do now. And you're in charge of it. And so I looked around um, on the web just to find some examples of what 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 teen book clubs actually look like. And this is a, a teen book club that's in a school. And, you know, and, and I and I don't mean to throw shade at all during this presentation, but this looks a lot like a class to me uh, because there's a grown up. You know, when we look at the sort of the hierarchy of and the power structure here, there's a grown up standing, they're presenting, they're presenting to some young people who have, they're being photographed for the local newspaper and still have a variety of expressions on their faces. And, you know, in public libraries, you know, we don't have the luxury of, if you'll excuse the expression, forcing young people to participate in a book club. And, you know, when you look at this dynamic and you look at the structure of this interaction between grown-ups and these young people, the thing that I thought of was it looks a lot like this to me. Um, and we know as teen services professionals that if you are making yourself the um, the presenter, the entertainer, um, 
with teens that it's just a recipe for disaster. It can't feel like school to them. Um, and the public library is a place really where they have this opportunity to be in charge of things. And you know, the, the, the book club is no different than any other teen programming scenario where teens can really be decision makers and be put in charge. And so, you know, the structure of a story time that we're used to um, is, is very old. I love old pictures of libraries and, and librarians in action. And I have some pictures of story time back to, you know, 1910 and things kind of look the same. Um, and, you know, when, when we go through our library school education, we may not be taught a structure of teen programming, teen services, um, activities that put the librarian in sort of the context of a moderator in an activity that takes place in the library. And some of us really end up struggling with this. And we know that it's not working because teens vote with their feet. They really do. They don't have to be with us if they don't wanna be with us. Um, and there are some basic suggestions that, that I'd like to put forward to you that may help you evaluate book clubs, but perhaps your overall um, approach to, uh, to teen programming. So I would contend that the most important elements that we have um, related to teen activities or teen programming is really uh, the notion of cultivating teen ownership in their library experience and to allow them to be decision makers when it comes to activities that they engage in. And those activities may not you know, look like <laughs> what we may think um, they should look like. So again, going back to expectations and these young people that you see in this photo, which is from the 210 Teen, Teen Library Instagram account. And I really invite you all to um, uh, visit that. Gosh darn it, I forgot to put the QR code in there. But if, if you just go to Instagram at, at 210 Teen Library, you'll see really a variety of activities that teens engage in in the San Antonio Public Libraries. But this craft was something that started as one thing and ended as another thing. And it, it, I think it's important for us not to get hung up on that. And I think it's also important for us to relax about what, um, what a teen book club could be. And so if you ask yourself the question, like why, why do we wanna have a, a teen book club? And, you know, apart from those things, we wanna share the love of reading. We wanna, we wanna highlight uh, beautiful things in the collection. We want teens to um, appreciate um, reading for pleasure and selecting their own stuff. But, but, but we, I think if you look at the structure of the organization you're in, that that's a really important thing. So if you ask yourself, that question, why do we offer a teen book club? And if and if what's happening is um, that t a teen book club is the only thing that's permitted as um, teen programming, um, I think that, that that's a limitation and it may make it more tricky for you to develop a, a, a teen book club. And I'm gonna talk about some tactics for doing that in a little bit. Is it, are we doing it because it's an expected service? Because it, it has that sort of tradition uh, embedded in it, that's a lot like story time, that that direct connection between the librarian with a book and a group of young people. Um, is it really, are we limited because it's the only thing we can imagine doing with teens or, or did we land in an organization where there's been a teen book club for 40 years and it's, we're suffering to make sure that it, it continues. So we're in a legacy situation. And so what I want to tell you about now is some things that are um, tactics that we can use that will help us cultivate teen book clubs, cultivate that connection between books, um, books and teens in sort of a structured way. Um, because, because, you know, I, I, I suspect that, you know, the basic question here is, you know, how do we get teens? You know, we, we have the love of reading, we have the collection, the ingredient that's missing from this proposal is, is the, is, are the teens themselves. So let's look at some tactics here. And so the first two I wanna suggest are um, maybe a, a bit more structural, maybe. 
Um, and the first one is, um, when should you schedule your book club? You know, what is it? How do you do that? Um, I know, speaking as a grown-up person in the universe, that if you tell me the third Thursday of the month that I can't figure out when the hell that is, and, you know, how do we expect teens who may be experiencing barriers, like, they have to actually ask a grown-up to get them to the library. They may have a lot of outside things that they've got to do, and they've got to remember when the third Thursday of the month is. And so I would contend, um, as I would with any activities or, or programming that we provide for teens, that it's something that um, is very consistently scheduled. And so what I advise libraries to do is you should have a teen activity every week. You just should. And, um, you know, choose, choose that time. is, you know, Wednesdays at five, because teens will learn that Wednesdays at five means something awesome is going on for me at the library. And um, if I just turn up, something great is happening. And so during that regularly, re that scheduled recurring program, I would want to integrate some sort of connection between books and teens uh, as part of that maybe not as a standalone to sort of get things on our feet. And then the next thing I, I would wanna do is have a teen actually moderate um, that. So if you have the availability of um, teen volunteers, um, you may wanna recruit and um, have teens actually be the facilitators, the moderators at this. So you lower that sort of adult moderation or and, and even facilitation by teens, I'm sorry, by adults, and you turn that responsibility over to teens so it becomes a peer-to-peer -peer thing. And then let's talk about some formats that might be uh, useful. We're gonna talk about some of them that are in-person and some of them that are virtual. So the first in-person one is actually, so this isn't that book club where everyone has read the book and now we're prepared. We've just, we've, we have the nuances of the book in our head there is someone there with a set of questions. This is a book share. And so book share means that, that, and perhaps this happens at the end of your teen program, that the books talk about what they're currently reading or what they've read in the past that they like. So it's just an opportunity to start that conversation about books um, rather than having that expectation of that full, full blown, full developed book club. The next thing is a book ad. And I've done this a couple of times where, um, honestly, um, no one's read anything, no one's reading anything. So I invite the teens to, you know, run into the, sh go into the shelves, and find a book that looks interesting to you. And in 10 minutes, we're literally going to do an advertisement for it. You're going to, you're going to sell this book um, to somebody else because, um, you know, they, and it's very sweet to see that they start to advocate for books um, that they like. So it's literally an advertisement for the book. So again, making that connection between books um, and teens, getting them to dive into the collection and doing sort of like peer to peer um, uh, suggestions. And then book match is another thing that I love a lot that it's, uh, where you, where you, these are, you know, teens that maybe aren't reading something, they're not, they don't have anything they can think of in the past that they liked. And you ask them, what would you, if you could read a book about anything, what would you like to read a book about? And the answer it should be, I'd like to read a book about, and that may help it help you sharpen your reader's advisory skill, but it, it also helps teens do peer to peer reader's advisory. And we've discovered on more than one occasion that there, like, there doesn't seem to be a book that fits the bill. So maybe that's an invitation to to start writing or thinking about those books. And then apart from these sort of in-person tagged on to a regularly, regularly recurring um, teen activity, um, I want to share with you um, an online uh, possibility. And what I'm showing you here and it's probably very small for you and I apologize, is a screen capture of the 210 Teen Library Discord server. And so uh, when pandemic came um, and library services shut down, um, the San Antonio Public Library stood up a Discord server with teens. We started with 11 teens who were volunteers um, so we could contact them and it would not be creepy. So we grew from those 11 teens to literally hundreds of teens hundreds of teens it's it's uh we call it an online virtual branch that's just for teens and um 
one of the things they requested was a space to talk about books. And that has actually split into um, Bookworms, which is a teen moderated, this is a teen originated, teen moderated uh, book discussion group that happens on Wednesdays. And then they also requested a channel that's simply called Books, um, where they can talk about what they're reading. And so this sort of, um, I, you know, it is, I guess it is a book club, but this sort of place where dialogue, a discussion can happen peer to peer with teens, um, we think is very powerful. It's a place for them to make recommendations to each other. And it transcends some of those barriers of, you know, having to get to the library, having, having to get a, a ride to the library, having to actually, you know, have the book, have read the book by a certain time that may be pressure that may feel like school, but it opens up just a dialogue for teens to have um, around, um, about, around books and the love of reading and the collection. So I just wanted to share those thoughts with you today. And um, if, if we can concentrate on divesting from that image we have of a book club in our mind, and if we can also examine the real reasons why we want to provide a, a book club for teens, I think we can, um, if we answer those questions and free ourselves up a little bit, we can cultivate a book club with teens um, that really meets their needs and helps us do our job of connecting teens with great books. So I thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much. This was amazing. <laughs> um, for more book club tips, tips, be sure to check out the HarperCollins book club guide, which features tons of discussion questions, tips, and read likes. Scan the QR code on your screen to learn more and download the guide or ask for it in the Q&A box. And now we're going to move on to books. So the author panel portion of our webinar is coming. And without further ado, let's meet Brandy, Alana, Elliot, and Jen. Brandy Colbert is the award-winning author of several books for children and teens, including Blackbirds in the Sky, The Story and Legacy of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which was the winner of the 2022 Boston Globehorn Book Award for Nonfiction and a finalist for the American Library Association's Excellence in Young Adult Nonfiction Award. Her other acclaimed books include Point, The Voting Booth, The Only Black Girls in Town, and the Stonewall Book Award winner, Little and Lion. A member of the faculty at Hamlin University's MFA program in writing for children, Brandy lives in Los Angeles. We also have with us Alana K. Arnold, who is the award-winning author of many books for children and teens, including The House That Wasn't There, The Prince Honor Winner Damsel, The National Book Award finalist What Girls Are Made Of, and The Globe Read Aloud selection A Boy Called Bat. She is the member of the faculty at Hamlin University's MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults program, and she lives in Long Beach, California, with her husband, two children, and a menagerie of animals. And we have Elliot Treffer, a New York Times bestselling author who has twice been a finalist for the National Book Award in Young People's Literature and has won the Green Earth Book Award and the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award for Children's Literature. His novels include the Lost Rainforest series, Endangered, Threatened, Rescued, Orphaned, and two books in the Spirit Animals series. He lives in New York City, is on the faculty of the Hamlin University and Farley Dickinson University MFA in creative writing programs, and reviews books for USA Today. And last but not least, we have Jen Ferguson, she, her, a Métis and white, an activist, a feminist, an auntie, and an accomplice armed with a PhD. She believes writing, teaching, and beating are political acts. Her debut YA novel, The Summer of Bitter and Sweet, from Heart Drum at HarperCollins, won a 2022 Governor General's Literary Award and is a 2023 Stonewall Honor Book. Jen's second YA novel with Heart Drum, Those Pink Mountain Nights, has three starred reviews so far and is a Junior Library Guild Gold selection. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to have each of you give a quick introduction to all of your books so that those um, in the audience who haven't read them will have a little bit of background about what we're all going to be talking about. And uh, Brandy, why don't you kick us off? I would love to. Um, thank you so much for having us today. Um, so my new book is The Blackwoods. It's a multi-generational story about a Black Hollywood family. It's focusing on three characters. Um, two of them are teens living in the present day, Ardith, who is a child turned teen actor, 
and then her cousin Hollis, who has famous parents and the rest of her family is famous, but she wants nothing to do with fame. She just wants to grow up normal, living her life in LA. And then the third perspective is their great grandmother, Blossom Blackwood, who has passed away at the beginning of the book, but we get to see what her life was like and how she built this whole legacy for her family through flashbacks um, that focus on her throughout the book. Amazing. Um, Alana, we'll hear from you next. Oh, you, I think you're muted. Yeah, I figured that one out. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Someone's got to be first. Uh, so my book is The Blood Years, and it is historical fiction set in Chernovitz, Romania, which is now Chernovitz, Ukraine, uh, before and during World War II. It's based on my grandmother's experiences of growing up as a Jewish teenager um, during the Holocaust. And it's a more, it's a Holocaust book, but it's also a book about sisterhood and ballet and family and um, how one can love in the middle of so much hate. So I guess that's my book in a nutshell. Um, Elliot? Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, this is a charming young man, which is about a real life figure. He's a young uh, Frenchman who lived in the 1890s and was a piano prodigy and the youngest ever to win the first prize in piano at the Paris Conservatory at the age of 13. He became like the toast of Salon Society in Paris and played in the great halls and actually met a young Marcel Proust who was a teenage gossip columnist at the time. And so they kind of gain their way into like the best parties. But Leon gets a patron who's sort of this dandy count um, and that winds up eventually poisoning all the connections he's made for this young man. And he disappeared from history at the age of 17. So Charming Young Man is the, um, my novelization of what I think happened and how it all went down back in the 1890s. And then Jen, take us home. Uh, hi, I'm lovely to be here. Uh, Those Pink Mountain Nights is a book about three teenagers who work at a lo local pizza shop. Nixon always has to come say hi. Um, one of them is Métis like me, one of them is Cree, and the other one is a white Canadian settler. They are working really late at night and Berlin steps outside and she thinks she sees a missing native girl that the police have stopped looking for. The next morning, they come into work and find out that their boss is uh, selling Pink Mountain Pizza and planning to franchise it. So the novel is a critique of a certain kind of capitalism meets the No More Stolen Sisters human rights crisis. Well, before we get into um, the meat of this discussion, we're going to kick things off uh, with a little warm up. We're going to do a couple of uh, fun round of would you rathers. Um, so we have those in front of you right here, but try not to think too hard, I guess. So I'm going to go around to all of you, um, kind of in the same order, I think, that we just introed you and uh, answer these questions really fast um, just to just to break the ice. So let's start with the first one. Would you rather have a friend who loses your books or dog ears them? Um, so I don't loan out my books <laughs> because that's how much I love my books. But if I did, I would say I would rather than just lose it so I don't have to see it defaced. <laughs> oh, Brandy. <laughs> I love that. For me, it's the opposite. Like I think dog hair away, like, you know, the book is, is a, is a living document and the more it's been worn out, the happier I am. So go for it, <laughs> but give it I'm, back. I'm with you, Alana. I am the friend who dog ears the book. So I, <laughs> it was I also nice friendship while it lasted, but so long, Brandy. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, never, never again. <laughs> I'm with you, Brandy. My students already borrow my books and don't return them. So I don't need to see the damage they've done to the books they've <laughs> borrowed and not returned. Would you rather secretly love a book that everyone hates or secretly hate a book that everyone loves? Um, I, Does I Brandy think... have to go first on all of these? That's, I no, like that. Well, I'm going <laughs> okay. well, to flip them back the other way in a <laughs> halfway through. <laughs> Okay, I'll I'll start this one. Um, I mean, I think I already secretly hate a lot of books that everyone loves. I just don't talk about it um, publicly. So I would say that, yeah. I don't think I'm much of a secret keeper. So I think either is probably pretty difficult for me. Uh, but I think I would rather secretly hate a book everyone loves because I have this whole like sort of, you know, belief that I try not to yuck on other people's yum, which is a phrase <laughs> I heard once. And so, yeah, there you go. But if I, if I love a book, I'm, I'm going to tell you about it. 
I actually love all books and don't have any hatred in my heart. So I can't really answer this question. I feel like in either case, I would want to argue with people all the time. So, so I think I need to like follow Elliot here and just like have no hate in my heart ever about books. I believe you. Um, I'm going to go back. Jen, why don't you kick us off for this one? Would you rather have dinner with your favorite character or your favorite author? I feel like doing either of those things would disappoint me. Um, I feel like I'd be disappointed either way. Uh, I don't want to have dinner with anyone. I just, <laughs> I just want to sit by myself. You can have dinner with that charming cat. Uh, Nixon, I think was the name. Um, I would choose dinner with a favorite character because that's magic and that's really great. And that'd be a lifetime story that a fictional being came to dinner, which is just awesome. So, character. I think Elliot and I might be the same person um, split into bi-coastal realities. <laughs> I agree. It would be magical and fantastic. My only problem would be deciding which character. Um, I think I would rather have dinner with the author because they created the character and then I can talk to them about how they were able to create a character that I loved so much. Um, same order. Would you rather read a book with an infuriating cliffhanger or a book where your favorite character is killed off? So my policy is I don't read a series until it's done or it's done. Uh, so the infuriating cliffhanger, please. Thank you. Because I can just pick up the next book. I'm ready. Oh, but the real problem is the sneaky series where you don't realize it's a series, the whole first book and like the word's not out yet. Um, I would like to read a book where the favorite character is killed off. In fact, I, I really like those books because I like to cry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm with Elliot again. Um, I'm okay with... Uh... Uh, the killing off of the favorite characters. Um, yeah, I'm controversial statement. I'm okay with animal death in books too, actually. So even, you know, there's a whole list about like, you know, books where the dog dies, like a warning page. And um, I think you see a couple of my books maybe on one of those lists. <laughs> I was going to say, Alana, yes, you covered that. <laughs> um, I think I would rather read a book where the favorite character is killed off. I think that's like really risky and bold. And so I like to see authors doing things like that. I was like the ones where the first person point of view is killed off halfway through the book because you never see that coming. Um, okay, we're going to start with Elliot on the last one. Uh, would you rather read by a fireplace or on a beach? Uh, I would rather read by the beach. I will dog ear my books at the beach and get sand in them and seawater will bloat the pages and the whole the whole deal um when i'm at the beach i am usually walking i'm not much of a sit in the center so um but i do love to sit and read by a fireplace so a cup of tea and i have a pet on my lap so definitely by the fireplace beach um, i'm pretty much an indoor person um but i did recently spend time on a very pretty beach um so I maybe current me would say a beach. Awesome. Okay. Well, I do have some questions for all of you that I want to get into, but I think before we do that, I know uh, you have some questions for each other about your own books. So we're going to first kick things off by um, turning over the reins to you. So uh, I know you've kind of all been reading each other's books. So as much as you all want to engage, um, in this portion of this, feel free to. Um, but I think we're going to start things off um, by Jen. I think you have a question for Brandy and we're just going to start there. And then, uh, yeah, take it away. So you wrote a historical novel, which I'm assuming means you did a lot of research. All three of you did. I am assuming there's lots of research here. But Brandy, yours is particularly about an elite Hollywood family. So what movies were you watching as you uh, got started writing this book? Um, you know, it's funny, like I end up doing like a lot of my research like years ahead before I actually know that it's going to be helpful to a project. Um, so my answer is going to be kind of boring. Like I didn't actually watch anything in preparation for it, but I would say there were two memoirs that I read that really helped with my research. And one of them was um, Cicely Tyson's memoir. Um, I believe so bad with titles. I believe it's called Just, Just As I Am. Um, it's amazing. I highly recommend it. And then Diane Carroll's, uh, I think it's her second memoir. 
and it's called The Legs Are the Last to Go. <laughs> and it's just both of them were so incredible and just gave me so much insight into what it would have been like, um, you know, to be a Black actor, Black actress, particularly growing up or coming up when they did in Hollywood. So that's my answer. Jen, um, so your books, I love that the first book and this book both sort of center uh, an eatery um, in one way or another. So your first book had an ice cream shop and this time we're treated to a pizzeria, two of my favorite places. Um, so two part question. First, uh, what about you, sweet or savory? Well, because I like pineapple on pizza, the answer should be both. I did see that in your book, right. All right, a little bit of a cop out, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay so the second part one of the other things I love about your book is is how much setting is such an important part of your books um setting becomes you know elevated to to the role of character um and so what do you think what is that process how do you go do you intend that what's the process of creating of you know creating these settings and um incorporating them into your books so I usually tell people that character comes first when I'm writing and that plot is a secondary consideration or I, I don't think about plot as much. I think about character and conflict, but I'm going to revise that statement and say that character shows up in a place. I kind of know where the place is when I start writing because I don't think you can tell a story without a place. But, you know, go ahead and try. I'd love to see that book. Um, and that the conflicts that my characters are going through are directly linked to where they are now, where they grew up, their relationship to the land, um, and particularly writing about Alberta, the, the particular kind of place that Alberta is in Canada. Um, and the kind of things that would happen in Alberta and never happen in, say, Ontario. Um, and then, uh, Brandy, if you wanted to talk to Elliot about his book, feel free. Yes, thank you. I was trying to figure out if I was next. Okay, <laughs> Elliot. So in Charming Young Man, music and the life of a musician are very prominent. Um, so when you were writing Leon's story, uh, were there any contemporary songs or contemporary artists that you think would fit well on a soundtrack of your book? Oh, um, yeah, I'm going to have to push the definition of contemporary. These are nothing that the teens in your book clubs would consider contemporary. <laughs> But that were contemporary for me when I was a teenager. Um, my brother would always play Morrissey really loud from his bedroom. And there was a song, This Charming Man, which I think probably processed somewhere in my mind to come out with the title of Charming Young Man for this book. Um, but in that, you know, he's, he's saying like in this charming car, this charming man pulls up. And it was sort of like Morrissey wasn't really out in his lyrics exactly, but it was this moment of like a man describing a another man being charming and like his point alongside was a source of thrill and, like, and the subject of a song, which felt like really transgressive and scandalous and appealing to me. Um, and so I think captured sort of the feeling of Charming Young Man, the, the novel, where, you know, you have this experience of the closet where all these emotions are going on and there's like, you find ways to express them or to be in the world as close as you can to being transparent with that while still feeling safe. Uh, and so I think that's, that's sort of a big part of the book. I'm also like George Michael's Freedom 90. I think there's something you should know. I think there's some, someone I meant to be. Um, also a kind of like veiled coming out song with amazing supermodels in the video. Um, so those are the ones for me. Um, Alana, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, so this book is based in large part on the experiences of your grandmother uh, who uh, grew up in Romania during wartime, during World War II. Um, in a town that I think is actually now part of Ukraine, uh, so now would be considered part of that country, and of course, this is a terrible time for Ukraine that's in the midst of a war, and so I just wonder how you, what you make of the kind of like big overlap of this wartime your, that your grandmother went through in the current war and the experience of teenagers today, and your grandmother as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, when I was writing this book, I was thinking about going to Ukraine, to this town, Chernivtsi, to do research, and then uh, war broke out. And I was like, well, I guess, you know, I'm not going there right now. Um, but I do, there's a character in my book. It's my main character, Frederica's grandfather named Opa. And over and over again, he says, everything is cyclical. Uh, and I think that that certainly is true of the 
my book, but also of what ha- what we see happen over and over again, both in this this area where Russia came and you know took over, um, and, and then after the Russians, the Nazis were there, and now we see Russia again invading. But also here, like this is also an American book because I'm an American author. So even though it's set in Romania. I think the a lot of the concerns I can't help but write what I am and who I know, and so I think that sort of the rising, you know, wave of of fascism and anti-Semitism, along with you know um, all the other isms that are you know certainly prevalent here today, are what informs the book as well. And so I think a lot of the struggles that teens face in this book, although they're much more dramatic than the struggles, you know, much more overt. Um, I do think that the cyclical struggles um, feel eerily echoed uh, in this book. In fact, originally I wanted to write this book as a as a futuristic novel in which the Holocaust had come again, um, but that started to feel a lot less like a fun um, sort of mental game to play with myself um, during the sort of, I've been writing this book over the last 10 years. Um, and at a certain point I realized I just need to write straight historical fiction. That was a heavy answer. <laughs> Way to bring it down, Alana K. Arnold. Here it comes. Um, well, I have some questions for all of you. So we're going to move into that portion now. I know the uh, group panel on Zoom can be a little weird to navigate without um, eye contact. So feel free to all jump in at any point. We're going to talk over each other. It's going to be fine. Um, and I can prompt as needed uh, when we're answering questions. <laughs> um so we're just going to go for it. It'll be great. Um, but I, uh, well, let's kick, let's kick it off by talking about that kind of historical real people aspect, because I think in one way or another, you have all written versions of real people. And I think it's, it's the clearest for Elliot um, and for Alana, because we have like a version of a historical figure and a family member, but Brandy and Jen, I think you've both crafted homages to, um, to people who were and are real and for Brandy that's you know the women of Black Hollywood in the past and in the present um and for Jen that's I mean it's an homage to the indigenous women and girls who have gone missing um you talk about the highway of tears so for all of you how did you balance staying true to these these real people or real people with real stories um and to your characters I'll just jump in um so I think um one thing that was really interesting is that because Marcel Proust became so famous, he's, you know, by many, many people would consider him to be the most famous novelist of the 20th century. Anyone related to him whatsoever, like scholars have really assiduously kept all the letters and, and um, notes. And so Leon and Marcel had some letters back and forth. So um, I was able to use those and read those in the French National Library to get some information about Leon. First of all, I only have college French and Leon's handwriting was terrible. So I didn't actually get that much out of the letters. But I was able to use this sort of his he was a really peripheral in Marcel Proust. Uh, and Proust ended up kind of lampooning him as a character in remembrance of things past Leon as a social climbing Arabese teenage violinist named Morel. And um, so I kind of considered charming a man to be my way of revalidating his experience, this like poor kid who just wasn't didn't have the right veneer for high society. And so Marcel Proust like cast him to the side, like, like I wanted his story and I wanted to sort of like undo the damage that Marcel did to his legacy um, many decades later in his novel. So I was able to take the fact that we didn't know much about him to sort of fill in what was needed to make the novel work. And I was pretty frank about that in the author's name too. Um, what about you all? Um, I would say for me, it was right, because I didn't base uh, Blossom Blackwood, um, you know, who comprises the historical sections. Um, I did not base her on anyone specific, but I really wanted to get her experiences as a Black actor, you know, starting in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Like, I really wanted to get that right. Um, So I did as much, like, research as I could around the time period, and especially research about Los Angeles, because that's where she grew up. And I read this book, and I'm looking at it now. Uh, I always forget the title of it. It's called Bright Boulevard's Bold Dreams um, by Donald Fogel. And I loved that book so much. I, this is such book nerd stuff, but I like totally kissed that book when I finished reading it because I just loved it so much. It like provided so much insight into what it would have been like to be a black actor it told, you know, starting with um, the first, consi- who I guess was considered the first black actress, uh, Madame Sultawan, 
um, you know, back in the early, early 1900s, um, all the way, I think he went all the way up through the 50s. And so that allowed me to just really provide the like accurate little details that I really wanted to about the time period and, and what Blossom would have been um, experiencing. But also it was really important for me to get Los Angeles right at that time because I've lived in LA for 20 years and, you know, I didn't know what it was like back then, but I really wanted to be able to give the reader a view of that. So I would say that book, uh, as, lo as well as the memoirs that I mentioned earlier, were both very important um, to my research. I am I'm going to say that because I'm writing contemporary stories about real things that happen in the world um, for teens who live in the world where these things are happening, uh, and a lot of teens might have experience with the things I'm writing, part of it is is you do the research, you you, you know what's happening in the world uh, from a first person perspective. And then part of it is imaginative empathy that you can step into the life of someone who is not you and imagine with empathy how, how their, real, their real life on the page should look like or how they're gonna feel. So I'm going to leave us with imaginative empathy and pass it onward. Yeah, I think that's super important um, for sure. So, yeah, so my stories started with my grandmother's story. So it was very hard for me to not tell the story from the perspective of someone who was the way my grandmother was sort of um, wrapping her story, quilting it for me in ways that made it gentler and easier for me to hear. So my grandmother told me her story over and over again. And each time it was like a level deeper, a level deeper, a level deeper, you know, starting with when I was a kid, all the way up through when I was a published novelist. And then I was like, I think I want to write about you. And then she gave me even more of her story. But even then, I think she probably still had layers of quilting wrapped around some of the most terrible things. And so I found that in my drafting, my, my character was telling her story in the same way, sort of protecting the reader. Um, and so I had to try all sorts of things to take away that protection. Um, and one of the things, what well, ultimately I realized, oh, I don't want to hurt my grandmother. I don't want to like do bad things to this character that's based on my grandmother, which is what my editor had been saying to me for five years. But it, one day I said it to him, like, you know what I realized? I don't want to hurt my character. <laughs> and he was very kind of like, oh yeah, that's a good point. You know, so that, that was sweet of him. But um, so it took me years um, of going through. But the other thing that was really important to me was I didn't want to sensationalize the Holocaust. Like, I don't want to make stuff up about the Holocaust. There's enough terrible things that happened that I didn't want to like create dramatic moments of things that could have happened. So it was incredibly important to me that everything was something that either did happen or was a version of what had happened. And of course, my grandmother's story is not a novel. So I had to find ways to fill in all the other spots. And so basically everything that's in my novel either happened to my grandmother or is a version of something that happened to another Chernovitz uh, survivor. Uh, or is a version of something that happened to, to a, either a survivor or a story about someone who perished in other parts of Europe that I then was able to take and move into Chernovitz. Even the dreams that my main character has are real. They are based on a series of dreams that were recorded um, by a woman named Charlotte Barat. Uh, she was a, a up and coming psychoanalyst um, in the 30s and took it upon herself. She was not a Jew to record uh, the Jew, the dreams, of, I don't think she was a Jew, uh, of Jews during the early years of the Holocaust. It's called the Third Reich of Dreams, the Nightmares of a Nation, 1933 to 1939. So she like snuck out this collection of dreams that she had recorded, written down. Um, and probably everyone who had these dreams, almost all of them died. Um, and so the dreams my character has are all versions of those dreams. So it was a very interesting and difficult and oftentimes what I found myself doing was getting really into the headspace of this sort of trick I was doing of you know how am I going to meld all these real narratives and that would keep me sort of again quilted myself from having to experience the actual pain of what was actually happening so in my like final draft which was I think draft seven a lot of that draft was about pulling off the sort of the quilting well, it's and, and Jen, what you just said really kind of struck me because I do feel like while I was reading all of your books, like how protective you all were of 
your characters because the moments where I had like the emotion, the strongest emotional response were like not when like really bad things were happening to all of them, but um, like when really like when the softer things were happening to them, like Brandy, I was thinking about your book and it's like, I think for Blossoms, uh, like she she like came up against some really difficult things in Hollywood, but the moment that sticks out to me when I look back at it as it's not to like give too many spoilers away, I guess, but when she's, um, when she's like at the Oscars and she has the realization that like, it's a huge success, but it might also be the farthest that she'll ever climb. And that was like, that was, um, like one of the most difficult moments as a reader in her storyline because it, it was like harder than all the difficult things she went through and like Jen uh like in your storyline like reading Kiki's poetry was like really difficult to read and it was harder than like some of the more like overtly difficult parts um a lot of I like lost it during all of the scenes with Frederica and her grandfather because like all of this like during when it when the like second conversation about the bear um which were like softer and they were like felt like in a safer space than like some of the actual difficult like hard things because there was just more distance between like the characters and the hard things that were happening. Elliot for you it was uh with Leon and the flower seller at the end so there were all these like hard things that were happening but you like protected the characters protected the readers from it and then there would be like these moments of softness where you like really felt it happening and that I think is where the kind of that empathy piece comes in. And it's kind of wild that that happened in all of these books. I don't know if you all have thoughts on that on your own or each other's books as well. I, I, I felt really it. Felt oh, it. sorry. I'll go first, Elliot. I, I just, I told, that moment you were talking about with Brandy's book, especially with Blossom. And it was just like such a sort of great, like, you know, like when we teach showing versus telling, like Brandy's book is about so many things. And one of the things, you know, that are, it's about these wonderful characters and their problems and, and secrets and generational, you know, trauma as well as sort of uh, generational inheritance. But it's also, you know, it's about uh, being black in a world that isn't meant to make as much space for the black characters as their white counterparts. And so that's such a great microcosm, that moment at, at the, you know, at the Academy Awards when you realize, yeah, you know, that what a realistic and kind of heartbreaking, you know. So I love that moment too. So, sorry, Lee. go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say about Jen's book, um, the, uh, there's this way in which, like there's this thrumming, dreadful feeling that a girl is missing, you know, from the start and throughout. And yet everyday life continues and teenage lives continue, including like their most minute things, like who I'm attracted to and how this job is going and what's gonna, you know, what does capitalism even mean in my life? and of course, those concerns still happen, even though this other this girl is missing. And I feel like that's something that we, I feel like YA can do so well is that because we're not writing for ourselves, we're writing for a younger audience. Like we can broach this like deep abyss, like terrible feelings and terrible situations in ways that leave you empowered to live and to move forward and find strategies to go forward without, you know, sort of just obliterating your reader. Like because we know that they're they're younger and they feel things so deeply. Um, and I think that's something that. Um, you pulled off so well in your book. So I'm I'm thinking a lot about how the world is really, really hard. And just in general, but then it's harder for anyone uh, whose identity is in some way marginalized. And if we're going to sensationalize things, it gets harder and harder and harder. It's like, why would anyone want to pick up the book and, and read it if it's just going to be really hard? Um, and that's why like those softer moments exist and maybe the emotion actually hits you not in the the most sensational times but it, it hits you with the everyday life it hits you with like the moment with the flower seller it hits you with conversations with grandpa it hits you when you're like having these relationships with your cousins like those are those are the moments that it's it's stronger I think if you're if you're writing about real things and about the world being hard for a lot of reasons. Well, I also want to talk about um, how each of you wrote, uh, I think, really pivotal parental caregiver roles into each of your books. Um, and I think you all managed to kind of highlight the love between generations and the stark differences 
um, between generations. And I'm wondering, to take this kind of in a more book clubby direction, are there conversations that you hope your books might prompt between parents and children? And are those different from the conversations that kids might be having between themselves about your books or about the topics in your books? Okay, um, I've got one. Okay. Parents don't know everything. There's a scene in those Pink Mountain Nights where Berlin and Cam talk to Berlin's mom about like a thing and they're like, is, is what we are doing bullying and Berlin's mom doesn't have an answer. She's like, no, but but there you should keep thinking about that and you should go and talk to the person that you think you're bullying. Um, but she doesn't have an answer for a really complicated question. And I feel like that's really important to to recognize for teens to be like, that mom did not know everything. And like, that's okay. And probably more realistic. Um, I'm gonna piggyback off that. I think that's great. And I completely agree, um, you know, as a supposed adult myself, you know, I don't have children, but I just feel like I don't really know what's going on a lot of the times. Um, but I think with my book, uh, it was really important to me to show, I guess, how choices of our ancestors um, sort of can often impact um, who we are today. And, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. And it, I don't know, I, I guess for teens, I would like them to read my book and see, yes, this is like, you know, you follow Blossom from teenager um, through adulthood. And so I guess you're reading about an adult character, but like she still has, you know, problems maybe making the right choice a lot of times and she doesn't always do maybe the I don't know I guess she doesn't always do the right thing that's what I'll say um but she made the choices that she thought were right for herself um in the moment and would be right uh to grow her family in the way that she wanted to and so I think it's important for teens to read that and see like okay again adults don't always know what's going on but you know also how their choices affect um, future generations and that it's okay if you don't get it right like you know Sometimes you're going to figure it out. Sometimes you're not. Um, and that's okay. It's very human. I think it's kind of, this conversation kind of speaks to the power of the teen book club, especially in today's climate um, with where we see books as such a source of political challenge. Um, and I think just knowing my own teenage experience and, and knowing the people I thought I knew in high school and what I've learned about them in the years since, like so many teenagers have stories they're not ready to tell yet and they won't tell in your book club and they won't tell their peers anytime in their high school. It could be about sexuality, it could be about childhood sexual abuse, it could be about any number of things that they're thinking about, hidden disability. And that when these come up in books and, and you discuss it, like maybe in that discussion, that person, that teen isn't going to like speak up about how their own identity is expressed in this book. But something I've learned by, you know, writing LGBT books is that just the fact of it happening, that discussion happening in that space is sending a statement to everyone in that room that this is like this is a story that is worth having a book about that it's worth having a conversation about and you don't have to you know sort of self-account about why it relates to you directly but the sheer fact of the conversation you know of all four of these books i think the sheer fact of that conversation is proving that in this space in this room in this group your stories are valuable and we we are we want to hear them and i think that is something that we have to keep saying over and over and probably being more assertive about now than we were in years past because the opposite side that's trying to say these stories are not allowed here is getting stronger and stronger in their voice or they seem to be getting stronger in their voice. There's more of us, but they're, they're shouting really loudly right now. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that other than, you know, Elliot, thank you for saying that. It's absolutely true, everything you said about um, just, just having the stories existing in a public space and having the adults in the room say, here's a book for us to talk about and read probably matters maybe, you know, at least as much as, as what you say about the book later. Just the fact that it's it's being elevated in that way is important. And the sheer fact that your books are so frequently challenged, Alana, just for being so frank about menstruation, the fact of menstruation, right? Like That is something that we can have like a public awareness of. Like that is that should be expected in groups, not hidden away and so, so terrible that you can get fired yeah. for mentioning it. What's so, and this book has, Guess what? There's, you know, period scene in it too. What's so interesting to me, and I know we're almost out of time, is how different all four of our books are and how different all four of our identities are and our backgrounds are. Like so we cover so much territory as far as like the American and North American experience. Um, and yet all four of us are probably people who are experiencing these sorts of bans and challenges. Like they, 
it seems like they don't want any story that's, you know, brings up almost anything. So it's so important that we're louder um, and it's hard to be loud. It's, it's much, and there's a character in this book that says, you know, it, it's so much easier to, to destroy than it is to create, you know, I actually think I'm the character. I think I see it in my author's notes. So there you go. Look at me. Uh, but it's, it's like, it takes, it can take all day to build a sandcastle, but all it takes is one mean bully to come kick at it. And it's you know, ruined in moments. And so what do we do? You know, like we have to build stronger and harder and get more of us building together um, and, and not, and, and, and rebuild. And I think we're at a rebuilding moment again now. So thank you all for the, the work you're doing, rebuilding with your book clubs. Well, this is a little more for um, Brandy and Elliot, but um, I think you each wrote books that are, I mean, really infused with joy in a lot of really weird, um, <laughs> real ways. Sorry, not weird ways. Um, it's a very hard one. And your characters each come face to face with the restrictions of their eras, um, especially in Blossom's story. But I think uh, it, it comes into her, her great grand daughter's stories too um and I think you both examine the cost of art and ambition and the price of fame um but without giving any spoilers I thought it was really interesting how Blossom and Leon have kind of opposing um although not unhappy endings so I am interested to hear from you both about how you crafted those narratives and their characters and how you decided what was the most important thing for these characters um like what what you needed for them uh, as you were as you were wrapping up their stories and writing their stories. And you are, are muted if you're talking. I was trying to get him to go first. <laughs> um, he knew exactly what I was doing. Um, <laughs> and uh, also thank you for saying if there are joyful parts of my books because I don't get to hear that very often. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, Blossom's story was a real saga. Um, you know, my first, before I even set out to write the story, I was like, well, I'll like talk about her, but there won't be any like flashback scenes. I was reading an old email to my eight, my agent and I was just like, oh boy, <laughs> that, <laughs> that isn't where we ended up. Um, but yeah, what I really wanted was to show, you know, how you have this really successful, um, tight knit, um, famous family and everything probably looks great from the outside. And then to just really see how that was built, um, truly from the ground up. Um, starting with Blossom, you know, when she was a teenager and decides she wants to be an actor and how I did want to sort of juxtapose like the really exciting moments, you know, like when she um, makes the dance, the integrated dance company in LA and, you know, when she starts getting her first auditions and stuff, but also show, you know, that while there are so many ups, like there's so, it, being an actor, I'm not an actor, but I've, you know, worked, uh, I worked for an actor's magazine for a long time. And so I've heard all the stories and, you know, edited all the stories um, that they've all told. And I just know how many ups and downs there are. So it was really important for me to show that even when you succeed, even when you try as hard as you can, you don't give up. Like, you know, you can be rewarded, but you're really just going to keep dealing often with challenges, um, especially when you are living the life of an artist, which, you know, I think we all know very well. Um, so that was sort of my focus. I just wanted to be as truthful as I could um, while showing, you know, the highs and the lows. I think your book feels so epic that way that you really do have such a like huge scope of like emotions and dynamics throughout the Blackwoods. Um, yeah, for, for Leon, I think, you know, part of what funneled the book, fueled the book for me was, I remember in college, like realizing like people around me were networking, like they've they were making friends because their friends had like important parents and like there was one like freshman year like um, in April like we had a conversation at lunch and everyone was like talking about what internships they had lined up and I was like internships like where did you go to college Elliot I, I don't think you mentioned <laughs> it I don't think you it was, this is Harvard <laughs> University um, oh okay like, I was like, internships I was, I'm just gonna work at like an ice cream shop like I didn't know we're supposed to get internships and it felt unjust it felt wrong to network and to like use connections and friendships that way and um I think that's basically Leon's character, you know, that French Belle Epoque society in these salons was really about who you know and what, who gets you access to what. And Marcel Proust can really work that system, yet his sort of buddy, romantic companion, Leon, can't and doesn't, and sort of doesn't want to and doesn't feel equipped to. And I think that was the big sort of question and conflict of the book. And in the end, ultimately, Leon has to choose, you know, is he going to work the system to get prestige and access, or is he going to return to his major passion of music, even if it means he's a music teacher in a small town. Um, and so that ultimately, when I think about novel structure, it's often about 
sort of this choice that it might be leading to. And that was Leon's joy was ultimately the, the music, um, which feels like thematically potentially a spoiler, but not physically about the plot itself. <laughs> Um, this is, this is more of a comment than a question, but I loved to, I mean, I love, I loved how like uncharming he, how he just never figured out social situations. Um, because I just feel like that's something you don't see that often. Um, yeah, to capture that in the cover, we had them put a little Bieber mustache on him. He didn't have his mustache originally. <laughs> and I think it just captures like, oh, he's, he's, he's not going to work, Leon. Like you're trying, but it's not going to work. <laughs> and then I feel like I'm I feel like I'm like so focused on Blossom um in your book Brandy but I really just loved how um like how much she knew what she wanted and how encouraged she was to like go for what she wanted like how much her mother encouraged her to like go after what she wanted and it was like it, it she it wasn't just that she was chasing a dream it was that she knew what her dream was and I thought it was interesting how that was like something that later her granddaughters um, I think especially artists like struggled with because they didn't they didn't know what they wanted in that same pure way that she did so it was interesting to watch their struggles um, set against hers so I was really glad you included her in the end I think too like Thank they're you. not knowing what they want like is 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 a privilege you know exactly that, yeah that they have this built-in structure that allows them to be lost in a way that she didn't have the the blossom didn't have the sort of you know she had to choose, you know, if it was going to be, well, I don't, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take the fan of the Blackwoods. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was sort of the thing I think I realized after I wrote it, of course, as we always do. Um, yeah, that it was like a privilege, like for Hollis to even be like, I don't want to be famous. Like, I don't really want to work. Like, you know, she can take a gap year or not go to college or she can do whatever she wants. And, you know, people who came before her didn't really have that option. Um, Alana and Jen, this is, um, I'm sorry, this is less joyful, but um, there are parts of both of your books that, uh, I mean, they were so viscerally upsetting. I had to like stop reading the book for a little bit. Um, but I think my takeaway from it that I thought was interesting is both like characters in both of your books have so much reason to be angry. Um, and like, I know Frederica at the end of uh, your book, Alana even talks about like, like that she does have like hate in her heart and that she hates people because of everything that's happened to her, um, which stood out to me because I feel like YA books, uh, like there's there's the, like the conception that they have to end with hope that they kind of shy away from, from letting their characters hate like that. Um, and then Jen, I know in your author's note, you, and also in this webinar today, you've talked about how like the world feels so heavy and how it's like so hard to kind of come up against these things and still walk away with those feelings of hope. So I'm, but I also had it. I had it when I finished both of your books, I still felt hopeful and there was still, um, like there were still positive feelings and I still felt hope for the characters and for the world after I finished the book. So I'm wondering how do you balance that hope and despair in your writing? Um, how do you take care of yourselves when you're like dealing with all of these things? That's, I guess, for all of you. Um, how do you, yeah, birth something like this into the world and, uh, like still like tell the people who are reading it that like things are going to be okay, even though they have not been okay. I think for me, a lot of it is sort of, uh, intellectual gymnastics. Um, I get very in my own head and very interested in the shape of something and the structure. And I tell myself a lot of sort of stories about, um, the process that, sort of separate me. And I used to get this a lot in counseling. I used to get a lot of, um, well, you're telling me what you think, but not what you feel, um, from my, you know, my therapist, which I kind of think is bullshit because I don't think I can separate thinking and feelings. I think they're the same for me in many ways that I don't think my therapist understood, but I think that by, by sort of foregrounding my thoughts, my intellectual experience, I was able to maybe protect myself in some ways. Uh, one way I'm going to grab my book real quick that I think I was able to sort of do the same thing for my readers is like, there's an extent, oh, you got to see my whole outfit. Um, good thing I put the pants on. Um, is that I, um, I include, there's an extensive four note, four note, uh, introduction and also uh, an afterward, but there's also pictures at the end of, of my, my family. Um, this is, these are the four main characters. This is my, uh, my grandmother's grandfather, 
my grandmother, her sister, and her mother. Um, but at the very, very end is my favorite picture. It's the very last thing you see in this book. It's a picture of my grandmother, um, as I knew her, happily waving goodbye to us behind her gate that she would close and lock every night. And so, like, it, it's not a happy story necessarily, but there's this real happy ending of my, you know, my wonderful Nana. So I think that that is, it sort of surrounds the story for my readers in the same way that I feel like my Nana surrounded her stories for me when she told them to me. I think I have two points. And point the first goes back to Elliot saying that by having a book club and, and like having conversations happening that you don't have to participate as like I feel or I, I think and I am exposing myself um, is why books are really useful because Maggie, you could like close the book and put it away and take a step away and go get a drink of water, take a break. Whereas like a movie keeps running or a performance can't stop. So I think there's something really valuable about telling these kinds of stories in books. My second point, which I am obviously forgetting because I said point one and then like point two, I was gonna forget, uh, had something to do with, there it is. Uh, I am a reformed adult literary fiction writer. That's what I used to do. And it was full of despair all the time. And it was only despair all the time. And what I learned was that writing for teens allowed me to write hope, allowed me to have hope in the story. From the beginning in those Pink Mountain Nights, I knew that it would turn out okay enough, that we would go through some things, but the ending, we would find all of our characters okay enough. And that seems like really important work to do and to like be offering the universe that we can get through the hard things and be okay enough in the end and then build off of okay enough. That's great. That unfortunately is about all we have time for. So I think we're gonna have to end on that note, but thank you all so much um, for being here for that. I'm gonna do one last whip around just to end on this note. This is in honor of um, Jen's book and because of that whole uh, pizza pineapple debate. Um, I also have so many questions for you about pizza being open and an open face sandwich, but we're going to come back to that at another time. So I need to hear everybody's favorite pizza topping really quick, and then we're going to move on. Mine's pepperoni and garlic. Jen, you, well, we know yours, but go first just to kick us off. Uh, pineapple, green olives, and some kind of hot pepper. And then if I have a fourth topping, goat cheese. Done. Beautiful. Elliot, go. Don't think, just say it. Uh, mushrooms. <laughs> Brandy. I will say, yeah, either plain cheese or mushrooms. And Alana. <laughs> Extra cheese. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Thank you all so much for being here today. This was an absolutely amazing conversation. Um, I think your books are going to be on some shelves soon, um, but this was great. For your next book club picks, if you loved those Pink Mountain Nights and you want more books where the setting is a character, uh, there are some books on the screen for you but that is um, Jen's uh, debut, The Summer of Bitter and Sweet. Also, The Cartographers, This Place is Still Beautiful, Lies We Sing to the Sea, Queen, and The Lesbianist Guide to Catholic School. Sorry, I just messed that up. Uh, it's The Summer of Bitter and Sweet, The Cartographers, This Place is Still Beautiful. If you love Charming Young Man and you want more books where the main character is choosing between two worlds, then you have Lies We Sing to the Sea, Queen, or The Lesbianist Guide to Catholic School. If you loved The Blackwoods and you want more books exploring intergenerational family relationships, you should check out Only This Beautiful Moment, An Impossible Thing to Say, or Nigeria Jones. And if you loved The Blood Years and you want more books exploring the consequences of war, we have One Last Shot, Nothing Sung and Nothing Spoken, and The Most Darling Girl, Daring Girl in Berlin. Thank you all again so much for being here today. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, slide presentation, discussion guide, and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones. Thanks to the HarperCollins School and Library team for sponsoring today's webinar. Be sure to visit harperstacks.com for educators' guides, author content, and more resources for teachers, librarians, and all readers. 
For all you fans of all things YA Lit, stay always stay up to date with Epic Reads, the leading online hub for YA. Be sure to follow them on social media channels for relatable book lover content. Save the date for the Winter 2024 Librarian Preview with HarperCollins Children's Books on October 20th to hear from the Harper Stacks team about some new titles coming early next year, as well as very exciting presentations from de debut author Tony Keith Jr. and award-winning creators Brendan Wenzel and Catherine Applegate. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And one more huge thanks to our panelists, Jennifer Velasquez and Brandy, Alana, Elliot, and Jen, and to our sponsor, the Harper Stacks team. This concludes today's webinar. We'll see you next time.